I don't know if it'd be interesting just to butt in here um, to talk about whether or not the manipulation... I'd really rather you didn't, okay? (laughs) (laughs) I normally don't say anything in these discussions, so um, there was a a little bit of a gap. So I I just was thinking this through, and I wonder if... I don't know if this... Because it wasn't, I don't think, particularly mentioned as a variable that you change within the article. But I think in general, there is something, and people know that this is something that you vary, Mike, is whether the, the kind of change of reps and reserve takes a role and has a role in kind of all of these different kind of variables that we're moving i'm pretty pretty sure all of us do that uh, as read from their article as well we have a it's a real simple explanation for viewers that are curious we like to start mesocycles at around three reps in reserve because most literature shows that it's a real for sure you're going to grow something kind of range and it leaves you a bit it's not super very fatiguing right so a stimulus to fatigue ratio is decent and then our thing is we're not trying all the way to failure over the weeks. We just add a little bit of load and add a rep here and there, and eventually failure results. If you try to stay in like an arbitrary RIR, it's fine. If you try to stay at three, 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 three the entire time, it's really tough to figure out what three RIR is. And you might have like a bad day and just do less weight and then another bad day and do less weight. And then you're kind of regressing and you're not even in that overload threshold. So to us, the three RIR is just to start you at the bottom end of that overload range and then make sure that you never fall out the bottom you just increase reps increase load a little bit going 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 and then eventually one of two things happen one is cumulative fatigue and your limits as a human being end up capping your ability to increase and you reach failure or close and then you deload and recycle or you turn out to be superman and you just keep getting stronger forever and then you're a captain america eric helms uh, who why would you even train if if you're that gifted is what i'm trying to yeah, that's one thing that I've been confused. Flattery will get you nowhere, Mike. <laughs> I found the opposite. <laughs> that's something I've been confused about this entire time. It's just that I, feel, I think we all sort of use RAR as a a quantitative metric for uh, making progress through the mesocycle. But we're kind of like, well, sets is, sets are bad or don't do load, but we're all using RAR. If none of us use RAR, and like you said, we stayed at three RAR the entire time, uh, performance would almost be impossible to track because the fitness fatigue paradigm uh, fatigue would catch up so much that there would be no increases in strength or maybe in the very beginning there'd be increases in strength and that'd be impossible to track because your three RAR at like 225 is going to go from like six reps seven reps and then you're just kind of stuck because fatigue is caught up in like six reps five reps four reps and it's like we have to increase or decrease RAR as one of those metrics so so just to clarify one thing, I we didn't really mention the progression of RIR in our paper. Um, we The example we provided is actually keeping RIR static. And, and it's not that I'm opposed to progressing RIR. Um, it was one example that we provided. And it's one that I actually, I, I use a lot um, with myself and with my athletes. Um, you know, generally you know, in application here, like I might start a movement, like a squat at like four IR for the intro phase, get it up to three and then, you know, maintain it or like a two RIR for if it's a, you know, upper body movement, for example. So, um, you know, you had mentioned that it, it becomes hard to track performance and I guess I don't, I, I don't completely agree with that because yes, the, the fatigue aspect is present there. And so you don't, you don't know, you know, say you don't progress. That doesn't necessarily indicate that there's no overload stimulus in place. Would you guys agree with that? Like if you say you stayed at the same reps for three straight weeks, do you think you're growing? It's possible to be growing during those three weeks. Growing, but maybe, maybe not optimally. Right. Okay, I think it depends so, on the, uh, the, the the level of the lifter, you know. Mm-hmm. If you can only expect the kilo of muscle growth in a year, then true. Then yeah, you might be growing some nanograms, you know. So, um, so you know, one of the the points, you know, with this reactionary approach to managing things is minimizing moving parts. I think is is one benefit, or m- minimizing 
unnecessary moving parts. And that's why we kind of use that example um, of, you know, having an auto-regulated form of double progression, because in, in my experience, and, you know, I've seen this happen quite a bit, you're able to see performance. It, it, you might see two reps the first couple weeks, and then it might, you know, trickle off to one, which maybe you can attribute that to fatigue. But I guess you can't, so I, I agree with the fact that it, it can be hard to gauge progress in the presence of accumulated fatigue. But if it's occurring in the face of accumulated fatigue, that's a good sign. Um, but I don't know how progressing RAR gets around that because you're just causing fatigue to likely climb at a faster rate. And I think that's where some people get mixed up. Like the, the idea of progress and progression or those are two different things. Like you can progress and add a rep, but be doing one lower RAR. You know, you can go from 225 for six at a three to 225 for seven at a two. And yeah, you increase the absolute stimulus, but did you actually progress? Like it, it's, did you improve? We don't know, you know, we, we, we can't say either way. So I, I guess I just wanted to mention that because I think, regardless of progression model, you have fatigue that, that makes things harder to interpret. Um, but I think the more variables you're progressing across the mesocycle, if, if you are improving, the faster that fatigue's going to accumulate and the sooner you're probably going to have to deload. Or, you know, as we talked about, the sooner you'll, you'll reach MRV and have that, you know, relationship exist. So I think a case can be made for, you know, if we're talking about going from, and this is kind of circling back to a previous topic, but if we're talking about the idea of going from 10 to 20 sets, um, if we're well adapted to 15 sets and we perform 15 sets and we're recovering, we're not really changing much. We're just managing things in a reactionary manner. I think one way that could potentially come out ahead. And again, we don't know because there hasn't been a study to show this, but I think it's plausible that you may be able to see that, that point where performance doesn't recover a little bit sooner, um, or not sooner, a little bit later. You may be able to extend the block a little bit more because you're not proactively progressing the stimulus even when progress is occurring. So um, that's a pretty good point. Um, I think that another way to see it is trying to hit a certain RIR every week um, itself inserts a new level of complexity. So every time you have an error of estimate and as fatigue climbs and the lifter has to reach further, further down uh, to make things happen, that that error of estimate for most lifters is going to start to go up. So for example, if I start a squat progression at 300 pounds and it's three RIR every single week after that, I have to make a new estimate of what my three RIR is every single time. Sometimes it's 300, sometimes it's 305, sometimes it's 315, sometimes it's maybe back to uh, 305 again. So, you know, that was three RIR. If that's if you're operating at the same number of reps each set if you have a range you can just you know load the bar with what you had the week prior ignore the reps for more or less in the back of your mind and just perform reps up until you reach that perceived proximity to failure and i guess that that to me seems like in your case yes if we had like three by six at three you know that that would be difficult but i think that's why you know one of the reasons we use that example is you can, once you hit the top end of the rep range, you can then, you know, add load the next week, you know, what loads you're going to be going into each set with, and you're not chasing a number of reps, you're chasing a perceived difficulty, which is ultimately what's going to drive the, the training adaptation anyway, is, you know, the, the stress acutely. I, so I, 
I don't think perceived difficulty drives as much training adaptation as objective increases in performance, uh, objective increases in stimulus exposure, rather. You can feel, uh, due to a variety of psychoneurological conditions, that to this week is harder than last week. And it might we're be talking about proximity to failure, though, not like Borg RPE, just to be clear. Yeah, I don't we're know talking if that about like missed. objective sure. yeah. RIR. So, yeah, RIR. Talk to judge because what you, you could have a situation where last week you did 300 pounds and you hit, you know, uh, seven, six, five reps. And this week you did 300 pounds and you hit seven, six, five reps because you just kind of weren't feeling it. Uh, and then maybe it really was three RIR, but we know from, well, Eric's literal research that people aren't so good at estimating RIR. And sometimes as cumulative fatigue rises and it's time to put yourself into a difficult situation, we have uh, a situation where we could be off by two or three RIRs from what really we are at the muscular level. So if you're pretty systemically tired or you're kind of, I'll say that this way, afraid of the load or afraid of the reps, which I am half the time where I train, you know, what I call my three RIR that day might really be a five RIR. I just straight bitched out, right? Yeah. So what we prefer to do is week one, we go roughly three RIR. And then in every successive week after, just move up the load or a rep a smidge and hit that number, hit those numbers. When you cannot hit them anymore and you start to fall off in performance, that's easy. You deload. You've hit as much as you're going to hit. And because we start at 3RIR, so that gives, depending on the trainee's age and their level of adaptation, anywhere between four and eight weeks of progression until a deload occurs. But because you set yourself a minimum baseline of 300 for set of 10, 7, and, and six, this is the beginning. Next time I either do 305 for 10, seven, and six, or I do 300 for, you know, add one or two reps in there somewhere. And the next time you challenge yourself a little more and a little more and a little more, that guarantees that you have to bring an incrementally greater psychological effort every time. And it real worlds you because three RIR specifically is on that borderline of what is less effective and more effective. We know anything between three and zero RIR is very effective. Below three, three to six RIR might not cause as, as good of an adaptation. I wouldn't want to have a maybe situation half of my microcycles where maybe I'm here, maybe, maybe I'm here. I would prefer a situation of first micro I'm here and every micro after either I'm wildly getting stronger and somehow my RIR is falling. Fucking sweet, I'll take that. Or I'm going up and then eventually failure offers us this objective standard of like, well, you physically can't fucking go anymore. Uh, and if you hit that, it's fucking sweet, you're done. And But if you've never hit failure, your entire conception of I'm always training at three RIR could just be false. It could be you are training at eight RIR your fucking entire last two years and it'd be none the wiser because you've never pushed it close to failure. Yeah, and I'm not saying- I, I, Sorry, I, I, I got to speak up real briefly just to make sure we accurately represent the accuracy of the type of RIR we're talking about. So when we look at studies where people put a given- percentage of load on the bar, and let's say 80% of 1RM, which is the most recent study that came out. This is uh, Colby Sousa's master's, which I was a part of. Um, they did squat, bench, and deadlift at 80% of 1RM, and they called out loud when they thought they were at a 6 and a 9 RPE, and then kept going to failure motivated by a research team. And they were within one rep, even on the 6 RPE, and the average was half a rep on a 9 RPE on all sets for all participants. We're talking 0.58 plus or minus 0.2 reps on their estimation at a nine and 0.96 uh, plus or minus 0.38. And these are, I would say, high-end novice, early intermediate lifters. So, and these are complex movements, squat, bench, and deadlift. If we move to something like a machine chest press or a row or a leg extension or a lot more hypertrophy movements, these are very accurate measures in trained individuals. And the research that shows when they're not accurate are in untrained individuals. Um, so I think we just need to be aware that, sure, there are some people out there who are inaccurate with RIR or RPE, but that would be the exception rather than, than the rule. Sure. But if you stay at three RIR, you're even an inaccuracy of one uh, takes you outside of the generally accepted maximum adaptation threshold of RIR. Let's say, let's say two. 
<laughs> you know, it's like, hey. Two is, two is better, but it runs into that same problem of you could have pushed it further. You could have been trying harder. You could have eked out more gains, but because of cumulative fatigue, you chose I'm not going to go there. So why? what is the real danger of incrementally increasing load and or reps slowly and eventually just going to failure? A controlled approach to failure, as a matter of fact, almost every exercise science study just takes everyone to failure all the time. We know it's relatively safe and we know because you worked up to it slowly, it's relatively safe. When you go to failure for multiple sets or whatever, zero RIR or failure, at the end of a mesocycle, you know for sure, RIR aside, this is when you've hit your objective peak. Another way to look at it is this. If you hit two RIR, two RIR, two RIR, and then your performance fell, okay, and you hit two RIR again, but your performance fell from last week, did you hit your maximum recoverable volume? Possibly, right? It, you could just be training and getting weaker. Next week, you could be getting weaker still. So, But how do you know when you were literally holding back? You don't know for sure. You said, okay, yeah, my performance fell, but was it really two RIR? And it was close. It could be one. It could be three, reasonably. But maybe it was just three that day. And maybe that's why we got weaker. So with a, a feed forward progression, like hey, we like to do, like every session, you increase a little bit. You find out for sure if, if because you, tr you have to try as hard as gets you a PR. And if you don't hit that mini PR, then you are stable in performance. And if you fall off, despite your best efforts to hit it, we can certainly say your objective performance is now down. You're almost certainly above uh, MRV. And then it's fucking really time to shut it down. I think it just makes it a little bit less ambiguous if you push the pace just a little bit every time versus trying to stay at one RIR, uh, at a certain RIR the entire time. No, I, I mean, I, mean, I think... I, I, I guess we're, if we're trying to apply this to, to bodybuilding, maybe I could agree, but I mean... There's an That's entire okay because because I mean there's entire paradigms of thinking like the bondage X, X style for performance and Mike T's approach that seems to anecdotally be working very well for extremely high level power lifters and the training I've used. There's nothing wrong with keeping a static RPE and watching your performance go up or down, and that actually gives a little more nuance to an advanced lifter who can't be expected to make objective increases on a week to week basis. Cause like you said, you'd be Superman if you could at an advanced level. And I also think you can't have it both ways. If we don't think we can see these objective performance increases week to week, then we can't pin everything on hitting MRV, which is based on whether you improve performance. Those are contrary concepts. If we can't expect to be rel relying on performance week to week, that also means we can't expect to be relying on a lack of performance or a dip in performance week to week, and then just assume that it has to do with fatigue rather than something else, an error in, in estimation. Those two arguments can't coexist. They can because the error of estimation is reduced by our progression method. And also, there are two ways to increase performance, but fundamentally only one way to decrease performance. If your performance is going down, that's just bad and you need to reevaluate what you're doing. If your performance is going up, it could be going up in a low volume paradigm because of primarily neural adaptations and less fatigue accumulated, or it could be going up via more hypertrophic stimulus, so on and so forth in a higher volume paradigm. When performance is going down, that's pretty unequivocally a bad thing. Certainly, I'm not one ready to defend, oh, your performance went down, it's okay, keep going. So I think those ideas absolutely can coexist. And what I will say in addition to that is on the powerlifting side and the strength side, I think the feed forward approach absolutely has merit. I think a ton of lifters will will not have faith in themselves that they can do more. Very advanced folks that are really fucking with it psychologically, they do the feed forward thing in their head anyway. Yeah, you tell them just go up to your 8 RPE. All the motherfuckers look at that goddamn logbook and go, what was my last 8 RPE? 800 pounds. And they're going, eh, Absolutely. 805, right? They don't just go purely off auto regulation. Because if you did that, when you got 800 loaded, you ain't, fuck that. I'm not doing auto regulation shit. I'm just going to do 700. I feel like that's 3 RPE enough for me. For advanced lifters, the more advanced you get, the more hardcore you get, for sure, the less of a, a bad problem that gets to be. But I think those people in their minds still have a feed forward logic where they go, I'm going to do a little bit more, planned a little bit more. And that happens in training all the time. I think a really good approach to auto regulation is to gently push yourself, not auto regulate, a little bit outside of your comfort zone more every single time. 
and let auto regulation guide as to how much you are pushing, whether that's too much or not enough. If you're like, fuck it, I'll add 10 pounds and your reps drop off. You're like, 10 pounds is too much. Next week you add five or two and a half. I think that's a great use of it. But just that's the only way it's used. Say that again. I mean, uh, that's the only way it's used. I've literally never heard anyone say ignore the logbook. And part of the reason why the the iterator accuracy is high and, and the way it's been used by anyone who's ever started with our, our based RPE is to take all that the information that you have into account, plus how you feel and how warm ups feel and sure. use it to adjust and to go in with the target number most most of the time as well. So then we're in agreement so, there that a target number has a lot of validity and then put, eventually absolutely. the target number will, if you keep moving that up, eventually you will probably reach zero or, or you know, so my, my question is this, if you're three R, 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 the whole three RIR or seven RP the entire time, and the person's adding a little bit of weight every single week to the bar, every other week or whatever, adding a rep here and there. And the last two sessions, they say, coach, I've legit, like I added weight and reps, but I hit eight RPE or whatever, or two RIR. Do you shut them down at that point? You're like, fucking reduce the shit, go back to three. Or do you say, cool, we're not going to do eights and then we're going to do nines and we're going to do tens. And then once clearly you're at 10, you can't go any further, then we deload you. How does that work from your guys' end? Like if someone in order to make a little bit EPR has to drop their RPE from the target range, is that when you deload or change some stuff around or how does that work? Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of the Revive Stronger member site. Inside you'll find a thriving forum, a growing exercise library, presentations, research reviews, and courses. If you want to get involved, sign up via the description. So I normally give someone an RPE range versus a target. Um, and a lot of the time that's more of a diagnostic tool, like having a, hey, I want you to hit a single at a six to eight today or a triple at a seven to nine or something like that. And that kind of helps me get an idea of where their performance at. And I expect it to do this because it does. Um, so for me to have faith in something actually being a performance dip, I need to see a little more than just, not, not, I'm not saying you suggest this. I know that we talked before, you're like, you want to see two weeks in a row of performance dips. Exactly. Okay, things, yeah. And I think that's a very reasonable heuristic. So similarly, um, and I guess I don't want to spend too much of a tangent on RPE. I'm just saying like, hey, we shouldn't take static RPE approaches across the table because before RPE existed, people trained that way already. Now we're just quantifying proximity to failure. You know, people would would keep a, uh, like you take a basic linear percentage, linear quote unquote, percentage-based progression and you do like eights at 70%, 70 at 75, 60 to 80. That's a reasonably, like you're kind of keeping a reasonably far uh, distance from from uh, approximate failure and just increasing the load linearly. That's more of a strength program. Uh, that's probably not what we would do for hypertrophy like we're talking about, but you can absolutely set up uh, a paradigm that I think is logically consistent and doesn't create any, any problems in my opinion, where the RPE is reasonably static and other variables change and you use are my changes in load. The objective increases relative in that same RPE range is what I'd recommend, like plus or minus one saying the same. Now, I. I, I, I just think that's, I, I'm mostly spending time on this because I don't want to be like, hold on, we, we're, now we're taking static RPE off the table. I don't think we should do that, at least in the context of a mesocycle. Um, obviously, over the course of multiple mesocycles, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think, like you said, just because we can't become Superman eventually, if you try to keep a static RPE, either the load will stop going up, the reps will stop going up, or the RPE goes up, or we'd all be lifting Jupiter. So it's, that's just a fundamental reality of, of progress to plateauing. But within a mesocycle, keeping RPE static, especially in an advanced lifter or even an intermediate lifter where they get 10 pound jumps and staying at a seven or something like that, I don't see any problem with that. Yeah. And, and that's would one way I... Very hard. You would deload them while they're still getting their progress and switch some variables. Personally, I would use, I use more of an auto-regulated approach to deloading to see if they're, because I, I don't like the assumption that, it, that fatigue accumulates um, because there are differences between how much fatigue resistance someone has, their ability to become more fatigue adaptable and necessarily, and sorry, not necessarily. And also there, there can be differences in what is an appropriate stimulus for that person and they have different mechanisms. So. I think that often, especially with more specific training, fatigue and stimulus track together 
but you can set up like a novice who has already maxed out their rate of gains with two or three days per week of training. And they will be fully recovered almost every single time, but making maximal gains. And that's much less likely to be true as you move through intermediate to advanced. Um, but there are cases where the expected accumulation of fatigue just doesn't occur at the pace that you plan it. I will say that if you progressively and prospectively increase volume in a reasonably large amount, you can make the fitness fatigue and stimulus dynamics fit the textbook definition. Like if you do have large increases in sets week to week to week, yeah, you probably will see fatigue accumulate as you in induce a stimulus, um, but it may not necessarily have to be that way. Um, that, that I don't think that's a fundamental law of exercise science that as you induce a stimulus, fatigue must accumulate unless you're doing highly specific training, um, which isn't really a thing for hypertrophy. So in your idea, then there is a potential way of training that maybe can be systematically arrived at that causes a stimulus, but does not cause an accumulation of fatigue. Or I would say, uh, no, I would say that. At a certain, if you're happy to accept an intermediate level of, of progress in a given outcome, yeah. Um, just like, for example, I would be happy to accept an intermediate level of progress. Oh, I wouldn't, and I'm not suggesting this is something you should do. I wanted to give a very factual response to your to your question to be clear. Like, yeah, that's true, but not for the goal that we're talking about in the context of this conversation. We're all trying to get as jacked as humanly possible. Yes, that will eventually become a reality, but I think from what I've seen. Uh, given that we know that there are a lot of variables uh, beyond what you put in the Excel spreadsheet that can result in accumulated fatigue, which may or may not be predictable, it probably makes more sense to have a, a model where there's a reactive deloading system. And there's, there's issues with that too, don't get me wrong. Anytime you suggest something, uh, you have to then deal with the, the consequences of someone may not being honest or wanting to push themselves too far or being too timid or too conservative. So it's, it's not an unassailable approach, but the variance you can see in say the data on showing someone a motivational video or a depressive video before they perform and having that impact it, or the number of self-reported uh, negative life events impacting rate of strength gains or mm -hmm. things like things that we maybe would, would want to manipulate, but can't like chronic, sleep loss, you know, or, or, or poor sleep quality, or unknown subclinical uh, deficiencies in iron, which has been related to uh, performance in like female volleyball players, I'm thinking of a specific study. There's a lot of things that in my experience, and in the data would suggest that fatigue accumulates from training, if it's stimulative at a high level, but that it the 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 the, the rate of change can be subsumed completely by external stimuli. So that you need to have some, I would say, not you don't need to, it would probably be better to have an approach where the deloads come reactively versus an assumption that as you increase sets, fatigue is linearly going up with it. So For sure. that's, that's, that's something that, that is so, kind of a... So, so just to reply to that, we're saying that... Uh, we're for sure comfortable talking exclusively in an autoregulatory deload paradigm, 100%, right? There, like you said, there's reasons to do proactive deloads that are more like you can't detect anything, but your connective tissues are getting ripped off slowly. And it, you, you should probably take an active rest, which you never did. You always felt great. And then your quad comes off. Yeah, for sure. Some proactive deloading is a good idea, blah, blah, blah. But just purely on reactive deloading or autoregulated deloads, I suppose our question to you is this, if you have someone targeting just a, a, a eight RPE or a, let's say a two RIR the entire time uh, through a mesocycle, which ends with an autoregulated deload. How do you know when to take the autoregulated deload? Because we would be in a situation where a person twice has hit, uh, let's say they had numbers in mind and they hit a, a one RIR instead of a two, right? Is that when you deload them? Or do you say, look, I mean, you're still technically gaining strength. Let's just keep adding a little load to the bar and see when you stop making gains altogether. What we're saying is that you stop making performance gains altogether is only ever very well knowable if you go to zero RIR or, or 10 RPE. Everything lower than that, and to the extent that is lower, the worse the problem gets, has some more error of estimation built in. So what we're saying is if you start a mesocycle of progression, if you cut it off anywhere before you reach close to failure, then you could have had more gains on the table that you just decided not to take 
which is perfectly fine. I just want to understand that is that when you guys would do the deload? Because we wouldn't, we would do the same auto regulated deload. We would cut it off when they were at zero RIR. And then the next week they were like, oh, I can't, I can't fucking do that. I can't hit the number of reps that I did last week. We're like, okay, you're for sure fucking too fatigued. Then we cut it off, deload, wash the fatigue away, and then start the progression at three RIR all the way up over again. So a couple things. Um, it, it's a good question. I think I, d I disagree with that being the only way. Yeah, I guess definitively, you know, you're training to failure. But if somebody is decent, like, I mean, Eric's example, um, I forget the name of the author on that recent study, Eric, but, you know, if, if you're Susan. saying to, to RAR, and that person is proficient at using RIR, which if they've been doing this long enough, I mean, two RIR, I mean, you should be able to get close there. And if, if you're not, if it's not perfect, it's probably the same margin of error that you've had in the weeks prior. So, so yeah, like if, if I look, like I'll, I'll deload somebody if I'm using a more, like I don't always use a reactive approach, but that's, you know, a top, a different topic, but I think they definitely have a role. Um, I'll, I'll have them go until they, you know, see that drop off or, you know, they don't, you know, match a previous performance. And then at whatever RPE target, at, right? our, at whatever RIR we have assigned. Yeah, sure. okay. um, and I may even give it two weeks, potentially. If there's like, I, I would want to see it across multiple exercises, you know, for, for a given muscle group. Um, and I would want to know like behaviorally, you know, external stressors, like how's your sleep, how's your nutrition, you know, are these things that are, you know, if we remedy these, would we then be able to easily continue to push this and start to, you know, move that needle a little bit more? Um, so I don't always deload at the sign of, of that. If there's other data that would indicate that there's other moving parts that be could be contributing outside of accumulated, you know, training fatigue. Um, and I, I wanted to mention one thing, you know, with the, the idea of using a static RAR, um, you know, if we look at the training variables that we have in place, we have, you know, with, within a set, we'll, we'll ignore the number of sets here. So we have load reps and then proximity to failure. If you're using an addition of reps and um, a progression of uh, RAR, then I guess when it comes to the actual stimulus, it's, it's hard to know, like unless you're tracking an estimated max, it's, it's hard to really know if there's a performance improvement there, you know, and, in, in like I, the example I told Jared, you know, if you do an additional rep, but it's at one less RAR, is that actually progress or did you just work a little bit harder? Well, and I think that's where performance improvement. it's for sure a performance improvement. What it's a perform is it a pro is it a progress improvement? It's not is under it performance improvement. It's doing it's more. A, it's doing more. Yeah. yeah. So is your, what you did last time is less your performance in the literature as measured sense has improved. Now you're trying harder, but your performance is elevated. Performance is a different topic than how hard you're trying. Your performance has gone up, absolutely. You were just trying harder this time. So what we're talking about is are the but underlying- But your 8RM is the same in both cases. Correct, but that's not a performance. Your 8RM could be the same, it's not a performance. That's a theoretical construct. Your underlying fitness adaptations is what we're talking about. Your underlying fitness, right? To use the sports science term, has that gone up? What we're saying is, because of the multifaceted approach you you guys mentioned for all the stressors and all the motivators, you know, your girlfriend kissed you for the first time or she gave you the middle finger and slapped you for the first time. I don't know which one increases performance more, actually, now that I mentioned that a specific example. But uh, so, you know, those go up and down. And uh, as far as we're concerned, cumulative fatigue really muddies the picture a lot. Uh, to us, it's very difficult to estimate what that underlying fitness is. We're not very comfortable doing it outside of after a mesocycle, after a deload has brought the fatigue down, measuring meso to meso to meso. So how was your average performance in this meso versus the next meso versus the next? That's what for us needs to be going up. Within a meso, we take a more proactive approach, get all the way up until you can't do anymore, 
deload and then see how you did because also muscle gains a, a lot of times and Cody Hahn has some great literature on this that shit takes a long fucking time you don't even know when that shit was set into motion it could have been weeks ago that all the structures started rebuilding and what you're doing now you're saying oh I did you know this many reps this week and that's good my performance went up that could have been from two weeks ago muscle gain that started uh, all kinds of other adaptations could be going there's hormones and everything so to us it's kind of a little bit of a black box from the perspective of seeing what's going on with your fitness so when we're talking about performance we're not talking about fitness we're talking about literal performance but once your performance starts to go down for sure fatigue is way too high and you cannot progressively overload as effectively anymore so then we're like we're not prepared basically i think we're on the same page with like if your lifter is getting weaker nobody's continuing the shit <laughs> like don't do so that. that's just the only way we use that okay um can i can i just make one one small point on the RR i guess thing? eric I'm pedantic, and this is my my PhD. There's an error associated with the zero RIR. We were kind of making this assumption that zero is therefore better than a one RIR. That's true in a lab. If I'm yelling at you and making you keep doing squats, I hope the IRB isn't listening, um, then, then yeah, you went to a zero RIR. But if you're alone in the gym and you went to a zero RIR, there's a effectively negligible difference in the error between a zero, a one, and I would even say maybe a two and a three RIR. I'm comfortable saying one or two RIR in, alone in the gym because when we take someone in the middle of a 70 or 80% squat, bench press, or deadlift and have them go to failure, sometimes there is a point early, especially when you're doing a lower percentage 1RM, where they think they're at a, a one RIR when they're at a four. So it is the higher the load, the more multiple sets, the closer you are to failure, the more accuracy if you actually go to failure. So I think this is an important distinction that we, I'm not comfortable saying that that going to failure, unless you miss a rep, failing a rep, like like Steele and uh, and I'm forgetting his, his co-authors, uh, Fisher and Steele definition of failure. Sure, like if you missed the 11th rep and you said yeah, I got 10 reps and that was a zero RIR, then yeah, that's more accurate. But if you stop at a self-perceived zero RIR. That is just as that's not what we're talking one. about. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We're saying you have an objective metric to hit. Last time you hit 400 for 10, this time it's 405 for 10. And if you cannot do that with all of your best efforts, that is more objective. Not saying that all the estimates weren't. They were very objective, just a little less so than like, I just fucking couldn't do it. If you just fucking couldn't do it, it's the most accurate way to track performance because there's no recourse because there's always at least one recourse with the RIRP. It's like, was I really trying hard enough? With If you failed, if you've got all your guts in you, you're fucking going. If you couldn't hit the reps, eh, there's not much to question. I mean, you could still question, was I trying hard enough? But at least there's no error of estimate problem anymore. Like I estimated my effort to be 100%. I fucking couldn't do the shit. So that's how, for Jared and I's purposes, that's how we track uh, are you still improving in your performance? Can you get, you know, we start nice early window, three RIR, slowly move up over time. Eventually, after some number of weeks, either they keep getting stronger or they hit, they just can't get stronger. And then we sort of cut it off. Yeah, I was just, just making the point where uh, earlier it was stated that zero is less accurate than a one RIR. And I don't think that in a pra practical sense is true. Okay, I want to make one more point about the, the static approach here. Um, you know, we, we've been talking, and this is common, I think, for all auto regulation discussions. Um, you know, the, the idea of sort of containing somebody, like, could you have, like, they sort of look at it as a, as a constraint, like, could you have done more? Or, um, you know, it, it's preventing you from biting off more than you can chew. But in this case, if we're, if we're talking about progressive overload, we go into the gym, we overload, we adapt. We need to keep pace with those adaptations. We need to stay within an adaptive range of our new levels of fitness, right? So if by using a, a static model, rather than having a rep target, by using an RAR target, it, it allows us on the days where we maybe we adapt 150% more than we would have normally. And we can do, you know, an additional rep more than we would have had programmed if we had a more, um, you know, a progress, a progression in RAR or a progression in reps, like do an additional rep each week until you fail or whatever. 
Um, so I, I think the benefits go like the, the critique there is like, could you have done, could you have worked a little bit harder if you're doing two RIR? Like, yeah, you could have worked a little bit harder, but it's also allowing you to stay more accurately, stay within that adaptive range and get the most out of your, like of your current levels of fitness and preparedness because you're chasing an RIR rather than an arbitrary number of reps that you're hoping will get you to roughly, you know, one RIR further down the road. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that because I think there, there's benefits. It, it, it's not just holding us back, you know, it, like auto regulation and using RIR or RPE. It's, it's not just to tame people's ego. It's allowing us to strike when the iron's hot too, and, and push those, wraps up further as fitness increases at a faster rate for whatever reason, better sleep, nutrition, girlfriend made up with you, whatever. Yeah. It depends on the comparison, right? So if you, if you go percentage one RM with fixed number of reps versus RPE, it's just as likely to hold you back, probably more likely to hold you back yes. unless you're a really aggressive programmer than it's to let you forward. If you compare RPE to going to failure, then yeah, there'll be some days where you are being held back but then you'll also accumulate fatigue faster and that person will probably have a longer, a shorter mesocycle if they're always training to failure on every exercise, which I don't think any of us are, are suggesting. So I think it's just important to remember what's the comparison because a lot of times people straw man the idea of, of RPE as always holding you back, like Brian said, where it's actually probably letting you move a little forward, which we saw in my PhD. I, I created a pretty reasonable, uh, ecologically valid linear progression of percentages compared it to an RPE based program and the progression and load was higher in the RPE group. But yeah, if you compare it to just go to failure all the time, yeah, I'd say those first three or four weeks, you're probably going to see more volume load, higher loads used in the failure group, but then they're going to kind of hit the wall a little early and the other group will still be having a productive mesocycle while you have to deload. So I, I don't so, know, it's probably not relevant to what you guys are, are talking about, but it's, it's uh, worth right. noting the comparison. For sure. So in our, our model there, you just have a slightly higher RPE or lower RIR target week to week is in, that, in essence how you can think about it. So it's still the same conundrum. We just lower the RPE a little bit to make sure that you're not ever fooling yourself into working, not working hard enough. Um, and another way to put it is, let's say you squat 300 for 10 at the beginning of a mesocycle. That's your baseline of if you dip below that, something's not right. So what you're going to want to do is not try to go, okay, for sure, 305, 310, 315, 320 deload. You don't have to do that. Some days it could be 302.5, and then the next day is 307.5, and the next day it's fucking your Titan is 325, and that, that hits you all the RIR targets that you want. But for us, it has to be at probably at least a little bit, because if you can't put a little tiny bit of load or one extra rep in effort... Sometimes, like, and the, the cool thing is about not trying to do the RPE RIR thing in every single time is if you increase the load a little bit or the reps just a little bit, some days, so week one, that was RPE seven, you or moved up a little bit. Then it should have been RPE eight or 7.5 to do just a little bit more. You had a really great day, a really great sleep for the past couple of weeks. And it was, turns out it was an RPE seven again, or even a 6.5. Or, or you you went up a little bit and it turned out that it was an RP9. This is a fucking dog shit day. Well, then the next week, it'll probably be better circumstances. And you're like, oh man, but 302.5 was hard as fuck. I'm only going to go up to 305 this next time. And then you see how your first set of 305 feels and it, whatever number of reps you hit last time, you hit the same number just with a little bit more weight. And you realize, oh, holy shit, like that was actually easier. Oh, thank God that last week was just a fluke. And I can, you know, work a little bit harder than this week. And then maybe in the second set, you go from 3025, you go 305. And then it's accurate for that RPE of that week. So we're so, not beyond RPE of that week model. I think that's great. And we still has all the same constraints and elements that you guys are talking about. We're saying that model should be anchored to an expectation and a feed forward plan of some kind of progression, because that prevents you from completely cheating yourself and just having three weeks where you just don't really feel like doing more, but your capacity has gone up, your psychology has gone in the way. If your capacity has truly gone up, that should be able to be reflective of that. And sort of lastly, I don't think there's a problem with having slightly shorter mesocycles that are slightly more aggressive. Uh, as long as you're deloading appropriately, you accumulate fatigue over the air is fine. 
I don't think having an eight week versus a six week mesocycle is a better thing. Uh, I think it's just two, two different ways to go about it. And they're at the extremes. Yes, you can have too short of a mesocycle, but I think there's pluses and minuses there that are kind of a wash. In your example that you gave though, if you go in and you perform the amount of reps and it's way heavier or you hit you know a one rir and it should have been a three or whatever and then the next week you dialed back and it was much easier in that example though you're sort of you're you're accumulating more fatigue in that session by over potentially you know i don't know how if you're doing this for every exercise it could increase to something substantial but I, I guess you're you're sort of using the argument of you know by using if a uh, you know feed forward approach, you can then dial it back on a week to week basis based off of how it felt. And I mean that it's sort of like not the it AP, it's not yeah, dial it as high or keep it steady. So okay, so, so can, okay, that's that's what I'm okay. I stand corrected. That so you're saying yeah, keep it the same or increase it. I mean I I would imagine there could be a scenario where you may hypothetically dial it back if things are just bare you. Sure, but like a local muscle light session or something. Like right. That. Or for like just an advanced athlete. So, so our truly, our real sort of, because we're speaking in abstractions here, our real philosophy is like this. Beginners and intermediates, it's, 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 it's more nuanced than this, but it's more like shut the fuck up and do the reps and the weight you're supposed to. I you agree. Know, this RIR that you're we know under the hood you're making the adaptation so nut up and do it because nobody cares what you say your RPE is anyway because you have no idea as you get more advanced as a coach a conversation with the lifter is like look ideally we want you to go up like this but like look bro if you had one set you're supposed to be an eight RPE and it was a fucking 10 no don't do two three more of those sets make the executive decision literally reduce the load but then you would do other things like take a recovery session instead of another heavy session later that week drop that fatigue down just in case and then restart the progression okay. so there's absolutely was, nuance there where we do very very similar things Okay. So yeah, I was just going to make the, the argument that if you're auto-regulating on a week-to-week -week basis, would it not make sense to do it on a daily basis, which is kind of what, I mean, you're still doing it, but just a different way. And I think ultimately we're, we're, we're getting to the same, the same end point. I don't think you have to push to failure to see, to prove that fitness capacity has gone down. Um, and I think that's ultimately, I don't think performance doesn't necessarily, I think we, you should deload when fitness capacity is no longer progressing and you could have a performance that does not really provide you insight into that. Like you could, you could have a, um, like it, it's a good proxy for sure, but like we're kind of um like you could have someone steps on a force plate and does a jump and if you've gotten a minimal uh real change in that before they even do the set to go to failure you get oh this problem this person's probably fatigued and run a deload mm -hmm. and there are decent proxies for that that you can utilize with a, a relatively high rpe on it like a tester set and yeah. that can become Maybe all you do that day, you worked up to a single or triple at 80% of 1RM on, on the main lift for the day. It was really low, uh, a really high RPE for, for what you'd expect, and you stop. And there's data yeah. to suggest that that would be pretty pretty valid without necessarily having to go to failure. Yeah. So, Or if you your performance in an absolute sense, you did more reps, if it's at a you know higher RPE or lower RAR, then or let's say you could calculate your estimated max off of an exercise. Um, if that's gone down, even though you did, you know, you progressed or your performance was higher, if we're talking about at, in the absolute sense, I would argue that what's more important there is that estimated max rather than what you actually executed, even if it caused your absolute max to go down. Yeah. If that, I don't know if I explained that I well. I totally but, understand that. We okay. just think there's too much noise to be making calculations like that. We like to have objective, actual performance determine these things, not just subjective uh, criteria. Well, well it, it still can. I, it, it still can, but stopping shy of failure. Like you can still you look, at look at 
sets that are shy of failure and have that be an objective measurement of performance. Could you not? I just think it's a larger margin of error when you're not, uh, when you're clearly not trying your hardest. So when you're trying your hardest, that variable is off the table and you're always, you're trying your hardest and you're always trying to improve. And then we can say, okay, you tried your hardest to hit this and you did. Uh, if you're not trying your hardest, that's one more additional variable to try to integrate because maybe your objective underlying fitness has fallen for sure. But maybe you just really just, it was it where you should have zagged and it was really a four instead of a three RPE or RIR. And, and then uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think there's a lot of data points, uh, especially when you get near the end of the mesocycle or if it's actually falling. So like approaching that near failure RIR, also increasing sets the way we have, because you could obviously increase a set one week and get like, your performance was really good. It was like 10, seven or 10, eight, seven. And then all of a sudden you got like a four on the fourth set because you added the set. But then the next week, if you get eight, five, two, two, that's clearly, it's going down. So because there's so many set increases and the RR is decreasing, that's a very clear measurement of this is. And, and then you could ask yourself the question, was I trying hard enough or did I try as hard as I needed to to hit at least the same set numbers? With the method we're talking about, you don't have to ask that question because right. you just have an objective very easy, uh, easy, very progressive, reasonable target. If you can't hit it, you're for sure fucking done. But if you hit it, then you stop there and you're like, fucking sweet, I did it. And, and it, it, uh, I think it, it very well indicates actual underlying uh, characteristics. Better, I would say, not better, more with one less variable to consider than, than uh, an RPE or IR type. Of I, if you're not using, like, I, it's kind of silly to keep talking about this, but... If we're not using, if you're just have a rep target each day, like you're going to do one additional rep, would you acknowledge that there's cases where you're providing less stimulus than you could within your recovery means? Totally. So would you go? Would you increase reps the next set then? Oh, if maybe. you were, if say, say you were, you assumed it would be like a one RIR and it was a three. Are you adjusting then? Uh, so it depends on the situation, but there's absolutely merit for being like, you look at your training partner and he was like, how many RIRs is that? You're like three. He's like, that was eight RIR. <laughs> you need to do more reps. And you're like, okay, executive decision. But okay. you could just not do that. I have no problem with that. So, so you could just not do that. You could accumulate way less fatigue. And then you bought yourself another week of progression. What I would say is it comes down to what kind of paradigm, what kind of metacycle design you have. If you have a metacycle design with a predetermined deload, like most athletes with time courses half like your bodybuilding show here you know when all your deals are roughly going to be you're not going to be like oh i'm still good and then you collapse on the day of the show or you do a powerlifting meet you know when your deals are going to be roughly speaking if that's the case then every single set and every single set you do should be as close of an approximation to your target rpe as possible so that even means altering the load between sets or, or reps between sets to be like that was a seven if i do another set of five it'll be an eight so i'm going to take uh, you know five pounds off the bar and it'll still be a seven for sure if you're doing an open-ended model where it's pure or regulatory if you uh, if you just underdo it a little bit in one week you could say okay i got some you know brian minor style easy easy gains on the bottom end of that overload threshold no big deal i still progressed uh and the next week i'm just going to move up again and then again and again and eventually it'll catch me so i think just two ways to skin a cat and real quick um wouldn't it be fucked up if we brought cats up to a sentient level and they found out that one of our common ways of speaking is there's different ways to skin a cat like how do you think a cat feels when it hears that? i mean holy fuck hey pascal here i just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service at Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. Oh, the most salient point of the whole conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think we should spend much more time on RPE because I don't think we're actually on much of a different topic. Um, one probably easy thing to cover that was also a motivator to write the letter to the editor was the claim in the paper that a descending rep scheme while increasing load uh, was inferior for hypertrophy. Um, that was another motivator for me because I just thought it needlessly took something off the table for people or, or made them fearful of a certain progression model when the data doesn't support that. So. Well, and before we dive into that, like when you, I guess, define how you, like define fatigue, how you're using it, is something being more, like higher intensities being more fatiguing, like what, objective measures of fatigue are you 
are you using? Because I think there's that sort of steers the argument a little bit because if it's, you know, psychological, that could be the case. Um, but of the actual physiological yeah. measures, in, in like this case, central well, peripheral muscle damage, the higher intensities are better. Generally. And connective tissue fatigue, uh, it, it specifically. Uh, I think that if you've been training uh, at a higher rep range and you've accumulated some joint and connective tissue fatigue, then progressively increasing load to the extent that it drops your repetitions and you're now training absolutely in a heavier loading range is bringing a very tired physique and one that has a couple of wears and tears as far as joint and connective tissue uh, integrity is concerned to lifting heavier than it is used to loads. And I think that exposes it to a risk of injury that is higher than it should be. I think if you want to lift considerably more load in a different loading range, you should do yourself the benefit of finishing your rep range where it is, deloading, washing away most of that connective tissue fatigue uh, uh, and disruption, and then starting from a place where you are more used to the loading range. And it's uh, now a heavier loading range, but you're starting it more fresh so that you don't run into the problem of bringing in lots of joint connective tissue fatigue to a situation where you're greatly increasing load. Real quick, um, yes, it is true that increasing the volume of training it exposes you to ever greater risk of injury. Increasing loads greatly, I would say, exposes you to considerably higher risk of injury. Bodybuilders have multiples the volume of powerlifters as far as average weekly volume, and they actually experience a statistically lower chance of injury than powerlifters do. The heavier you say that again, weight 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 lifters as well and strongman competitors as well. So the the more that you go heavy when perhaps not very well prepared for it and really do this with the loading, the more likely it is to cause injury. And because dropping your repetitions doesn't actually result in any more hypertrophy, it's if you keep the set number the same, it's roughly the same amount of hypertrophy. Uh, I'm not so sure why you would increase. So the downside of that, uh, dropping the reps by increasing the load considerably in a mesocycle is that it's potentially injurious. The upside of that is uh, to us a giant question mark because why would you do that? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's that's a great argument of bodybuilding against you know powerlifting or weightlifting. Um, in the context of the paper, where I think the example was dropping from 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, uh, I don't think those arguments hold up at all. Why not? So, because why would they? Because their body is like that process. So, so eight reps is more endur- injurious than a set of 12. You got any data to back that up? Any studies? Or? Absolutely, because the forces are higher. And every time they do any study of injury risk, higher forces correlate with a higher risk of injury, all other things being equal. We don't have to have direct data. I'm, I'm unwilling okay. to the direct data on this because we're just ignoring things that if that's not true, I, who knows what, what is true. That. So your, I, your so argument the, is- The idea, go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say the, the argument that you're saying is more on the connective tissue front for fatigue. And let's, let's say if we were to concede on that, and you know, I think 12, 10, 8, I, I think in practice probably doesn't, I, I don't know if that, like, I, I wouldn't see that. If it was like an undulation pattern of like 15, 8, 3 or something, just totally, you know, these large the disparities it's the same well, no, i know but okay if we're talking about concepts what you said in your paper though was um sets of 10 one week eight the next six the next and so on are likely suboptimal for inducing muscle growth so the argument wasn't even regarding injury risk and i think that's the claim that we're primarily trying to address is there's no evidence to support that it's suboptimal for muscle growth so uh, at face value by itself, that specific progression without the and so on, absolutely the same for muscle growth, provided you don't get hurt. Uh, very likely similar for muscle growth. However, if you go and so on, the next rep range drops. I should have <laughs> shitty writing on our part. The next is four and then two. And we know that sets less than five are reliably less hyper 
hypertrophic. So if you go much heavier, then we start to get into territory where it is it, it does in fact cause. So I will just chalk that up to just dog shit writing on my part. And as read up until the and so on, you, we're completely in agreement with you guys. That is equivalent hypertrophy. However, we would say two things. One, if you do the and so on, it eventually leads you to things that are just not a, a great idea as far as per set volume. I, I agree. Like that. that progression. Yeah, we're is on the same page. Uh, I, th I think we're margin, tiny margin. So, you know, I, I I'm kind of came when I first read this came from it <clears throat> from the perspective of your your typical like the RP audience, which I mean I think we all sort of speak to the same audience here. The, so the paper we wrote was absolutely not to the RP audience. Just to make okay. it very, our paper is not even publicly available. You have to buy it. So our paper yeah. was, was was as a theoretical concept paper for a more advanced audience. Okay. Well, uh, let's so say your audience. That. Okay. So maybe it's not intended, but your audience is consuming this information. And so, uh, what 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 bothered me a little? Well, not bothered me, but I, I guess what I what Eric and I. You can what, say right, you can say bothered. We bother each other all the it, time. It did. It, it fucking Nobody pissed me off, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you said because rising relative intensities are likely to add disproportionate fatigue, but no added per set hypertrophy benefit. They can be tentatively ruled out as a mode of progression for hypertrophy. Yeah. And so much I more think specific. that's just an, okay. So okay. Absolutely. Yeah, because like the only direct evidence is that reverse linear actually performed worse than linear yeah. in Presties. And then when you compare sets of like six to 12 or eight to 10 or 15 to 20, like every metric of fatigue that we have, whether that's session RPE, post set RPE, or suppression of force production would favor high, the, the higher load, you know? So it's, I mean, I, I've, of course I'm conceding that the higher loads get, the higher forces get the greater, uh, you know, mechanical stress. That, that, that's a given. I'm not arguing that. I think we just have to be careful. Like we don't want someone to think that they're doing it wrong if they go 12, 11, you know, 10 in, in a, in a, or it's suboptimal or, or, or muscle muscle growth, growth, which is what I yeah. do think it is suboptimal marginally because of that increase in, in slight increase in injury risk that didn't have to occur very marginally suboptimal. What else, though, is the Schoenfeld back in the day study of like three by 10 versus five by seven ish or whatever. Seven by three. Seven by three, right? Um, the groups got equivalent hypertrophy, but the feedback from the lifters was that it was grotesquely more fatiguing uh, when the heavier group than the lighter group. And the lighter group, essentially, almost every workout said, uh, we can do more. And at the end of the study, we're like, we can do more. And the heavy group was like, fuck, for the love of God, we're going to die. So, and that corresponds very well to our uh, understanding as coaches and lifters in the gym. You do sets of five and some shit. You can only fucking do heavy sets of five at bodybuilding volumes for so long as you fucking snap in half. You can do sets of 10 for a long ass time and have productive gains. We don't want to see a paradigm in which you go from sets of 10 to sets of five in a single mesocycle because that is essentially it gets you the same stimulus for hypertrophy. But at the end of the day, the, the fatigue from a connective tissue perspective, especially, and maybe there's an argument there for some kinds of nervous system fatigue to us seems to just be much higher. So why would you do that if there is no plus side to it and potentially only a downside? Well, yeah, if you use the example of seven by three RM versus three by eight to 12 RM, sure. But again, I think we're, we're, we're talking about the hypertrophy rep ranges. And like, sure. if you could go, now here's an interesting one. So Bartolome in 2017, they compared eight by 10 versus eight by three. And force production was suppressed to a greater degree in eight by 10. And there was greater muscle damage and soreness in eight by 10. And probably, greater total accumulated uh, connective tissue damage, what about if muscle? I had to guess. Say again? What about muscle growth? Yeah, muscle damage was higher in 8 by 10. Growth, growth, growth. There, there was an acute study. If we want to talk about growth, then we can compare, uh, I think it's uh, Prestes, where they went from, one group went from 12 to 14 RM all the way down to 4 to 6 by R RM, and the other group did the opposite, and there was greater muscle growth in the linear uh, versus reverse linear. Now, this is one study, but I think like if, if we're going to be making claims about uh, like injury risk, we have to be considering that, yeah, while there's higher forces per rep, if you compare something like 8 by 10 versus 8 by 3, 
the total cumulative forces, the impulse is going to be higher in eight by 10 by a long shot. So I, I think we just need like, it's a very binary, not very well thought through argument just to say, hey, lower reps, more stress, greater connective tissue injury, if we're not going to be matching number of sets, like, yeah, seven Four by reps. three versus three yeah. by 10. Thank you. But we are, um, but we are matching the, okay, so, but the we're not matching sets. You just compared seven by three to three by 10 is, is an yeah, argument. And I'm saying, hey, if we compare eight by three versus eight by 10, there's higher muscle damage, higher fatigue, greater force suppression. But those doing people eight get by more 10. growth too. But those guys get more growth too. So we're not matching a growth equated situation. We're matching a very different amount of growth now. With so the we're, we're addressing, we're addressing ahead, the we're, we're addressing the claim of fatigue. Like if it was with lower rep ranges, say it was like they kind of needed to have a, a large gap there to to answer this question, I think. So if it was eight and five, do you think the or eight and six, do you think the eight group would have had more growth then? Over the long term, yes. Eight by ten? No, set, sets of eight oh. versus six. Eight over versus the long six. term, yes. Yeah. Which but is I, I, the I it, guess it, I guess the, the in short, the growth isn't what we're trying to defend here. Um, I think it's it's the idea of lower reps being more fatiguing. Um, you know, as you go down in reps, whatever that magnitude is, they become more fatiguing. There, there's not considering they're looking at polar ends of this. Well, not polar ends of the spectrum, but eight and three. You know, there's a pretty big disparity there. And all of the physiological markers for fatigue are greater in the, the 10 group. I, I think that in, you know, in conjunction with what Eric said, like you're in terms of absolute force per rep, that's one thing, but there's also more reps per set. And so like the total area under the curve, but there's also be, more growth and there's, <sighs> So it's not growth equated. We're saying with the same growth. I know, but I'm saying the growth is irrelevant for this part of the discussion because it, we're we're saying if if you're saying that it's better that it's better because it's less fatiguing, and we're saying okay, the fatigue can't be the cause because it's not less fatiguing. What if we were to do something like in your example of ten eight six? where growth probably would be very closely equated and, and we know that the fatigue isn't an issue, then I, I, I guess that's, but it's an issue nonetheless. I think if you're no, interested, I, I, I think if to, to, to carry that argument, you have to look, you have to contradict a fair amount of evidence. Like if eight by 10 is more objectively fatiguing than eight by three, and if match number of sets of eight to twelve produce a lower set session R, session RPE and it's post set RPE than say twenty five to thirty RM, same thing for sixty percent versus ninety percent of one RM. Similar is if versus eighty versus ninety percent. And every data point we have, or all the data points collectively, would suggest that anything in the six to say thirty rep range produce similar growth. It's pretty indefensible to say that lower reps within the hypertrophy range and higher loads produce more fatigue when the data says they don't. Yeah, fatigue on a, on a total scale, for sure. On a, a joint and connective tissue uh, fatigue, I would say the lower reps produce more. Uh, two data points we could use potentially, or ideas we could use in, in the sort of uh, the other example is uh, the literature on people who do more of eight sets of three and less of eight sets of 10, they get hurt more. Uh, power lifters get hurt more than, than bodybuilders. So there's uh, something there. And, um, so, so that by itself is, is a huge thing. And also, uh, very precious few bodybuilders train in the close to five rep range. And many more of them train in the higher rep ranges, probably not by accident. Because as all of us who have trained, training in the sets of 10 to 20 rep range really fatigues the fuck out of your muscles. And, you know, let's say nervous system is roughly similar fatigue, just different kinds. But 
much easier on your joints and connective tissues, consistently doing lots of sets of like five or six reps will fuck you up sooner than later than if you're doing sets which are of a higher repetition range. So what we're saying is because there's no clear benefit of descending like that, then potentially there's uh, you know the downside of if you multiply the mesocycles over and over. We sure, sure as hell did not explain that well in the paper, and I'm not absolutely not defending that. But so, uh, that's how we see it. And I think from a practical perspective of what people read, I think that's good advice. I'm, we were very comfortable giving that advice. I'd say if someone is training for hypertrophy and they're saying this week I'm doing tens, next week eights, then sixes, what do you think? I'd say, why don't you just do tens the entire time and increase the load only a little bit and let the volume do its thing without progressing through load that much? Because I think at best, I just don't think it offers any uh, positives as far as we can tell. And at worst, it does marginally increase how much load you're lifting. I'll, I'll put to you guys another way. After I'm hitting you know, 300 on the bench for multiple sets of 10, if I have to a couple weeks later hit sixes while when in a state of really high fatigue and not used to that kind of loading, because that kind of loading changes your technique to a small extent, but significantly, I'm not doing that. That shit is too fucking dangerous as far as I'm concerned. I prefer to do 300 and then later do 315 and then later start at 315 and go to 330 versus going 300 through 30, 360 week after week after week. It's just, that's a big fucking difference. So... Okay, I, I agree with that. Um, I've also got to duck out in about one okay. and a half minutes. Okay. So are we in agreement if we're in the conventional hypertrophy range? Let's say 8 to 30. Is if, if you're saying that decreasing reps is disadvantageous and is going to cause more fatigue, then why ever do below the top end of the hypertrophy rep range? Not to mention there's data showing like 30 RM produces more fatigue than 8 RM. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think we're stating that as a categorical. No, you're not. It's a, it's a strong, it's a straw man, but it's like, I'm, I'm saying like, it's in a sense, it's, it's extrapolating your argument to yeah. a broader scale. So though. when you start at low volumes, and with heavy loads, there are benefits there, and you treat them as their own form of progression in that loading range. But if you drastically increase the loading through a mesocycle, okay. that presents its own problems. So we're for easing in instead of going boom, 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 boom like that, while fatigue is rising, etc. I would much like an intro week, as you guys say, into fives before I get my ass into fives from sets of 12 or some shit like that. Totally so agree with that. Okay. okay. Should we call it there? I know we've yeah, uh, yes. way gone over the mark anyway, so... Um, By the way, yeah. fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Team, I've got to head out immediately, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Eric. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to say to Better kind do. of some closing words, I guess, is just, I mean, it was fantastic just having you all on uh, chatting and talking through these things. I think it's probably furthered the discussion and also covered some points of potential kind of disagreement that maybe weren't quite as disagreeing as on paper. And also, I mean, there's areas there that are just so nuanced that maybe there isn't some black and white answers. And it is area where we need further research and you guys are at the forefront of providing that and kind of delving into this. So I think from myself and from the audience, just a massive thank you for kind of being willing to have these discussions because they're not necessarily comfortable, but um, they are needed and kind of they help further everything. And yeah, I, I just think it was great to just listen to you back and forth and kind of, yeah, really talk things through because I mean, thank God we have podcasts so you can do this because I can't imagine trying to do that through any other format. <laughs> Thanks, for Thanks Steve. Steve. Take care. Cheers, guys. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. You Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't 
that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another a really cool community for people within our little niche. It's going to be a website that will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.